I'm Donna. And I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 175. Y'all, I have so much stuff to watch on TV right now. I am like Templeton of Charlotte's Web when he's at the fair. Smorkishboard, smorkishboard. Yes. Like, whoa. I got Love Island UK, which is my fave. Love Island US, which is pretty decent this year so far. And also... They have some similar characters. I mean, they're people, but like, let's just be honest, they're characters. Right. But I'm like, wait, what happened? Oh, yeah, that's on US. Never mind. Okay. But Atypical, Mm -hmm. it's on third season, fourth and final season. Damn. I only watched the first one. What? It is so good. (gasps) So good. Anyway, so like I have that, Big Brother, like it's, it's so much. In a good way, but it's so much. Well, good thing it won't stop fucking raining here. I know, I know. You have nothing else to do but sit inside and watch TV. I know. I know. But, see, bad thing is that it fucks up my U.S. Love Island and Big Brother shit. Well, you know what it doesn't fuck up? Podcasts for Patreoners! <laughs> so, thank you so much, Lauren B. from Texas. Angela C. from Missouri. Rachel M. from Indiana. Mallory R. from New York. You wanted to do the New York City. I sure did. Elizabeth L. from Indiana. Elena C. from Louisiana. Jade H. from North Dakota. Becca S. from Texas. Celeste C. from New York. Mm. And Eilish F. from Ireland. Thank you all so much for joining Patreon and supporting us. If you want an episode shout out, head on over to patreon.com slash the APC podcast. And don't forget, there are tons of ways you can support us. If you can't support us on Patreon, you can always leave us a review. Follow us on social media at the APC podcast on Instagram, Twitter. I don't know, other things. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever else there is. (laughs) Join the Facebook groups, all the things. Yes. Okay, so... Carrie, the beloved Carrie, she mispronounced Donita's name in the Milk Carton Mini this month. Yeah, I suck really bad. Like, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I am the best friend that anyone could have if I do say so myself. So I thought, why not do a story that I will probably butcher everyone's name, including the town's name, too. Basically, I'm like Billy Madison when he peed his pants for his friends. So... I'm doing the story about possession that ran rampant in a convent. Well, thank you for taking one for the team, and I'm very sorry that I mispronounced the name in (laughs) the milk carton mini. Like, the most important name of the whole freaking story. (laughs) I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing at that. It's just, the whole time I was like, huh, okay. But, you know, like, do, 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 do. And then when I went to post it, I was like, huh, okay. And then I was just like, mm, let me ask her, how did you, do you remember how you pronounce that? <laughs> she was like, yeah, it, it was blah, Duanita. Du- yeah, I definitely had a moment where I just inverted letters. Yeah. I was so confident too. <laughs> Duanita. And I mean, you said it the entire time. So I had like, why would I question that? Like you were never like, oh shit. I was 100% sure <laughs> that I was saying that correctly. And then when she took a picture of it so I could know how to spell her name to upload it to Patreon. And I was like, Donita, wait, how did she say it? Not that. <laughs> That's what I do with numbers all the freaking time. All the freaking time. All right. So picture it. September 22nd, 1632, Loudun, France, or Loudun, France, if you want to get fancy, like Joe Dierte. (laughs) On this night in September, a nun awoke to find the recently deceased priest, who was their confessor, standing at the end of her bed. He was begging for her help and asking her to pray for him because he couldn't pray for himself anymore. He had died of the plague. So you see, the plague had hit them in May of the same year, the Black Death, and ended up killing over 25% of their population. 
So the nuns had been sequestered since then with no outside contact at all, which is what sequestered means, I know. (laughs) Well, this nun just kind of assumed that the confessor had been sinful and when he died, he's now in purgatory or something. But she was so frightened, she could not keep this to herself. So first thing in the morning, she ran to the mother superior, Jean de Agnes. You're doing very well with the name so far. You think? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they could all be wrong, but they sound right. Duanita sounded right, too. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> well, she told her what happened. Jean comforted the nine, but that night, Jean herself was visited by the apparition, and a few others were as well. So let me tell you a little bit of history about the convent and stuff. So it was rumored to be haunted, and it was opened up in 1626 and only had eight nuns at first, but soon had grown to 17 nuns. Most were noble by birth, and most of the nuns were young, and they weren't religious or called to the life of the convent. They were sent there because their parents were not able to pay their dowry to the people of the same or better rank. Or these girls had something that society deemed abnormal. You know, take, for instance, Jeanne herself. She was the daughter of a baron. She was sent to the convent because she had a hunched back. Oh my god, the fucking 1600s, come on! (laughs) Right? So early on in her childhood, she had tuberculosis, but somehow she survived. However, she was left with stunted growth and the back deformity. So she's lucky as fuck, but her family sucks. Yes. And it's said that she was mean and kind of a bully, like she was rude to people before they could be rude to her. So it was a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. Cool. But that's not okay to have all the time. Let's just be honest. Well, her parents wanted to get rid of their wild child. And, you know, they knew quote unquote, that no man would ever want to marry this person. So when she was old enough, they sent her to this convent. And within the first three years, her personality completely changed. She became docile and obedient. And when the mother superior retired, Jean was named in her place when she was just 25 years old. That's how devout she had become, or so they thought. You see, she was manipulative. She saw that, hey, if I play the game, I can rule this place. And that's what she did. She didn't want to have to play by someone else's rules. She wanted to make up her own. And so she ate dirt for three years until she was able to be head bitch in charge. Anyway, she was still that snarky, bitchy, defensive person But now she was in charge, and so people, you know, could gossip behind her back, but had to do what she said. And you see, gossip was a big thing around there, especially since they weren't allowed to leave the convent. And there was this one man who was at the center of all the gossip. The most handsome beefcake man of the cloth ever. Urban Grenier. I mean, he better be with a name like that. (laughs) Unless I completely fucked it up. And I'm sorry. He was as ambitious and intelligent as he was handsome. But he was also arrogant and sarcastic to the same degree as well. Urban was one of those people who were, do as I say, not as I do, holy men. Because he did like the ladies, and the ladies did like him. So what you're telling me is things haven't changed much since the 1600s. Yes. Okay. And he was very much hated by the men because he, uh... Stole their wives. Yeah. And their daughters. And he didn't have his views on celibacy and priesthood and stuff. Like, he was like, look, 
just because we are called, you know, upon to do higher bidding doesn't mean that we should be celibate. This is how I feel about it, and this is how I'm going to live my life. There were talks that he was the father of a child by Philippa, who was the daughter of the king's lawyer who lived in Loudun. He also had been with the daughter of the king's counselor. Like, seriously, he got around. But anyway, just know that he had a lot of enemies for a lot of reasons. And like, he was already brought to trial for being like impure and all the shit. But back to the convent and the hauntings. So soon the nuns started acting differently. At random times during the day, they would just have bouts of laughter where they would just burst out laughing where they couldn't stop no matter how hard they tried. Because we've all been there, (laughs) normally in church or like at a funeral or something where you're not supposed to laugh and you can't help it and that just makes you laugh even more. Well, then others started having convulsions. Then some heard voices at night. Others were even hit by unseen hands. Things were getting real weird. But also things were getting real wet for Jeanne because she was being visited by another apparition. But this one was of a person who wasn't dead. What? Like astral projection? You might say. Are you proud of me for knowing that? Yes, I am. It was of the handsome Urban, and he was getting frisky with her. He told her he loved her, and he placed his hands on her body and explored. He also repeatedly asked her to have sex with him, but she refused. I'm sure she did. Mm Mm-hmm. So she had to tell their new confessor, Mignon, about this. And he was like, okay, something is definitely going on. But, you know, like, I'll keep my eye on it. All right. But he's also like, tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> like, does he have a car? Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ah. Well, one day when the nuns were taking communion, they couldn't. Their bodies physically reacted to it. They spat. They contorted. They seized. Like, one just spit the wafer onto Mignon's face. And Mignon was like, oh, fuck. Demons. Demons. Like, I know what this is. So, of course, he called up his brethren and told them everything that was going on. So they decided that they had to do some exorcisms because these nuns were possessed. So other priests came to help Mignon out and exorcise the demons. And, of course, the nuns would go into fits when they were being doused with holy water and stuff. Once Jean, she started grunting like a pig, and her body started shaking uncontrollably. Well, Mignon stuck two fingers in her mouth and began performing an exorcism, and he demanded to know how the mother superior became possessed. How could this be? How many demons she had, etc., blah, blah, blah. Well, come to find out, she had seven demons inside of her, and it was also revealed that she basically had made a pact Of the devilish variety. But she didn't know it. It's when she picked up a bouquet of roses that had been found on the convent stairs. And she put them in a vase or something. Well, it turns out that they were from Urban. He had tossed them over the convent wall. And when she accepted them by picking them up, it sealed the pack and welcomed the demons inside of her. And that's when she began her obsessive love for him, and which is why she saw him at night. All the things. That's t- that's not fair. If that's real, like, that's not fair. So somebody throws something into your yard, and you just fucking pick it up, like, cleaning your yard up, and, like, boom, you're in a contract with the devil? That's not fucking fair. Right? You should have a little more ability to be like, hey, let me make this decision. Yeah. I mean, but you're also making a deal with the devil, so, I mean, it's not like it's going to be like... Fair, but you get my point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you should have a little more free will, I guess is my point. Yeah. Well, once during one of the exorcisms of one of the several demons that she had, 
It took two hours to fight and expel that demon. It was in her belly, and how they finally were able to rid her of that demon was to pin her down to her bed, and then they put an enema that was basically a quart of holy water up in Jean. Uh Uh-uh. An enema. No, that's not okay. A quart of holy water. I mean, how do they know it was a demon in her stomach? And how do they know that that was going to work, putting an enema in her? You know. And I mean. Oh, gosh. Also, I mean, who made that decision? Like, who tried that? Like, who was the one that was like, you know, let's try, like, shoving holy water up your ass. The demon's in the stomach. Let's try shoving holy water up your ass. Oh, probably because that's about the time they were bloodletting. So, seems reasonable. (laughs) (laughs) Well, just, oh, you're, like, talking about this. The first time... Urban heard of these accusations. He just kind of scoffed at them and was like, what the fuck? Okay. And he's probably mid-pump inside someone and was like, oh, that's dumb, and kept going. But the accusations just kept going on and on. So he finally wrote to, you know, some people he knew because he he was with the she-she people as well. And so he got a doctor to examine the nuns. And that doctor found no evidence of possession, which how do you find evidence of possession anyway? Who knows? But all was quiet for a while. But then all hell broke loose again. And so now the exorcisms were being done in public. And they attracted huge crowds. And by huge, I mean huge, like 7,000 people. Because, well, I'll tell you why. So the nuns were usually bound leading up to the stage. Because, let's just call it a stage, because 7,000 people are here to see you get this exorcism. And when the exorcism started, you know, getting to the meat and potatoes part, they'd start to get physical with the priest wrestling with them sometimes, usually mocking them, or they would start to do some lewd gestures, use cuss words, and then they would expose themselves. So the crowd of men would go wild. I'm sure they would. Mm -hmm. Some even barked or spoke Latin, which they really didn't know because they only knew some prayer stuff that they had like just memorized, you know, because again, they weren't real pious peeps. So it was a real roller coaster. The audience would go from laughing to cheering to gasping, and they loved every minute of it. Well, finally, the Crown and Cardinal Richelieu got involved. Richelieu was basically head of the Catholic Church and, you know, like minister to the king. And since they got involved, Urban knew there was no way he was going to talk his way out of this one. Like, shit. Okay, the powers that be have now, like, swooped in. You know, now, like, this is all public and these people are coming in. What the fuck? But during one of these public exorcisms, there is some evidence that was produced that unfortunately sealed Urban's fate. The demon Leviathan was speaking through Jean And he stated that there would be a document that would show the truth behind Urban and it would be found at the foot of a bishop, like a bishop in the crowd. And during an exorcism earlier that day, another demon had stated that like a document would be found with the blood of Urban on it. So like a blood pact. So of course now with Leviathan, Pretty much giving like, hey, there's a treasure map and it's under a bishop. So they're like scanning the crowd and there it is by a bishop. Surprise, surprise. And it was this written document and it was written in backwards Latin and it was signed by the devil, some demons, and of course, Urban. Hmm. And it said... And here, here's where I'm going to really fuck up some names. I'm sorry. We, the influential Lucifer, the young Satan, Beelzebub, Leviathan, Elamy, 
Astaroth, together with others, have today accepted the covenant pact of Urban Grandier, who is ours. In him do we promise the love of women, the flower of virgins, the respect of monarchs, honors, lust, and powers. He will go whoring three days long. (laughs) The carousel will be dear to him. He offers us once in the year a seal of blood. Under the feet he will trample the holy things of the church, and he will ask us many questions. With this pact, he will live 20 years happy on earth of men and will later join us to sin against God, bound in hell in the council of demons. And again, they all signed it, right? So they put Urban in prison and immediately searched for his body for devil marks. And they found a scar that they said is where he would have like pricked his finger for the blood pack. Like, also, how do you know what the devil's signature is and right. all of these things? Like, it's just silly, but okay. They also did this test to see if he was a witch or not. Oh, because we know how that went down with the witch trials. Right. It's very accurate. Mm-hmm. Because if he had made a pact with the devil, he wouldn't be able to feel pain in certain parts or some shit. Well, when they did it in his cell, they used like this long needle and he did yell out and it did draw blood. And it said that it went so deep, it went to the bone in some places. But they were like, yeah, in the places he really should have hurt, he didn't hurt as bad as he should have. Like he's definitely a witch. Oh, Lord. So when they're in this trial, they tested it again. But the story goes is that the person who was going to poke Urban, during the trial, was going to use something that basically was like a sleight of hand type thing that like retracted into the handle. So the sharp point pressed against his skin, but it wouldn't go in deep. So it wouldn't draw blood or cause a lot of pain. So it was a trick to make him look like he was a witch. But that's just word on the street. I'm not sure if that really happened or not. Well, color me fucking surprised. (laughs) Well, the trial lasted 18 days, and he was ultimately found guilty of sorcery, placing evil spells, and possession of the nuns, as well as certain non-religious women. And on August 18th, 1634, one day before my mom's birthday, many, many centuries before, (laughs) Urban was first tortured and, like, severely tortured with what they called Spanish boots, which was like a very popular torture device during that time. They were either iron like casings for the leg, but what they used were wood casings. And what they would do is they would place the wood on either side of the leg, and then the torturer would hammer wood or iron, but in this case it was wood, wedges between the casing and the flesh. Oh my God. Yes. And this was like, oh gosh, I mean, like eight or so wedges. I mean, it's not, it's not just like one or two, you know? Oh my God. So basically his legs were crushed, completely immobile. It said that he was so severely tortured, that the marrow of his bones oozed through his legs. And even through all of that torture, he refused to say he was guilty of consorting with the devil. He would say, yes, I've slept with women. Yes, I did, you know, things of the flesh. I've never signed that pact. I've never, you know, conjured up any spirits. I've never tried to possess anyone. I've never done any of that. And Richelieu really wanted him to say that he had conspirators. He was like, I didn't work with anyone. Like, I am innocent of what y'all are charging me with. And because he refused to say he was guilty, he was going to be executed that same day. Because he couldn't walk, because his legs were literal mush, He had to be carried. So he was. And every time he would like cry out for God when he was being tortured, 
they said that the people torturing him rebuked him. That's a quote. Because they said they knew very well that when he spoke of God, he really meant to speak of the devil. Oh, they can read his mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, he was going to be executed, but he begged, please do not burn me alive. Like, that's what's going to happen. His body's going to burn after it's hanged. That's the plan. But he's like, please make sure that I am strangled. My neck breaks before I'm burned alive. Because he was scared that the fear he had of being burned alive would, like, basically make him end up in, like, purgatory or some shit. Yeah. You know? And he was supposed to have, you know, a last statement and, you know, again, just be shown mercy by being hanged before burning. But the peeps who carried him up to the stage basically choked him with holy water so he couldn't speak. And they went a step further and they knotted the garrote where it couldn't be tightened. Therefore, when they opened the trap door, which that's really not what you call it, but brain fart, he fell. Yeah. Instead of being strangled, his rope snapped under his weight (gasps) and he was burned alive. Oh my God. Yeah. His biggest fear, what he begged to not happen, you know, and through everything though, Urban professed his faith in God and his belief that he was going to go to heaven. And so after his death, you would believe that everything went back to normal. But surprisingly, the possessions continued. Well, yeah, if it wasn't his fault. Right? So almost for four more years, they continued on and off. And the last exorcism was actually given in 1638. With everything that happened, people said this showed that the sinful are punished by death and that the Catholics were the most powerful religion and they were the ones who could get rid of the demons. Jean basically became a celebrity and was considered saintly by many. To the point that when she died, her head was cut off and preserved put on display so people could pay their respects and, you know, treat her as they do saints and all that jazz. And then the convent of Loudun is now known as like a holy place. But here's something that is what I consider definitely folklore because I only found it like in one article. But someone, they say a monk, saw a large fly buzz on Urban's forehead And that large fly would be Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. And so it's like at the end of his life, the demon's taking him to hell. So like he was sinful. He was the cause of all of this. And then the folklore continues that Urban had the last laugh because he told one of the fathers that he would see God in 30 days. And he did die within 30 days. And when he died... He was crying out that he was not responsible for Urban's death, the father. And then another priest who was involved with the trial against Urban died of insanity five years later. And then the doctor who falsified that pricking, he also died of insanity. And then one of the exorcists was later banished from the church. And then last but not least, one of the judges fell into depression and insanity, and died within a year. So it's like he had a final curse on all of his enemies. Yeah. But later on, people were like, huh, you know what? That's a little, hmm. All of that's a little weird because, you know, if you think about it, that convent was all of wealthy people. You know, it's wealthy people's, offspring that they offloaded. Right. So then the guy, Mignon, he had a thing against Urban. And then what if he he and the nuns had this all cooked up? Yeah, but that's a pretty elaborate plan. Okay. Well, let's talk about it. So during some of the exorcisms, nuns who didn't know Latin... They were conveniently 
possessed by demons who also didn't know Latin at all. You know, so. Yeah. Oh, don't have to worry about that. But then, say, some of the nuns who didn't know Latin or another language, if they were given commands in another language, they would have to be coached if they were supposed to know Latin. You know, like, oh, she just spoke in Latin. And so one of the exorcists spoke in Latin to do it. They'd have to be, like, coached more to, like, oh, this is how you're supposed to react. Yeah. Also, some were supposed to levitate, and then some were supposed to be able to read the exorcist's minds. And every time that they were tested for this, they failed. You know, others were supposed to have, like, strength of a thousand men, and they failed. But... Every time that they would have these moments of failing a test, they would just, like, expose themselves. And then the crowd would go wild. And, oh my gosh, you forget that it was just, like, a Milli Vanilli moment. Right. You know, like, oh my god, a nun just exposed herself. Like, she can't be of sound mind. Like, she has to be possessed. No one would really do that. You know what I mean? Right. And then also some of the nuns stated that they didn't believe they were possessed, but then Jean and the exorcist would like coach them that they were, you know, and be like, no, no, no. Don't you feel like you are? Right. Well, also one time there was a sister Claire and she had said that she didn't feel like she was possessed But some burning sulfur fell on her lip. And so she, like, flew into this, you know, fit because, hello. And so she, you know, was like, I I am possessed. I'm I'm so sorry. I didn't believe y'all. Like, I am possessed. But she was like, but I don't deserve to be treated like this, you know, and just kind of, like, said all that and was like, I believe what y'all have told me. I am possessed. And so people heard that. Even Jean was pushed to her limit at one point, and she was in the courtyard one time in the convent, and she was only dressed in her shirt, and it was in the pouring rain, and she had a rope around her neck and a candle in her hand, which is pouring rain, so I don't understand that, but okay. So she was like, I'm going to tie myself to this tree. I'm going to hang myself Because I cannot lie anymore on Urban. He doesn't deserve this. I cannot lie. But I think even like a higher up, like an archbishop was there. And he was like, oh, what? And Mignon was like, do you see the hold he has on her? Like, this is because she took the roses, you know? And like all of that, he's like, oh, yes, I do see. Like, she's going to kill herself because of the hold he has on her, you know? And she's like, no, I am lying, you know? Like, I cannot do this. And he's like, this is what he's making her say, you know? And so it was just like, oh, my gosh. Also, why would Mignon even care about Urban? Okay. Well, there was this rift going on between the Catholics and the Huguenots. And... I mean, I think basically, y'all, I'm a history major and I fucking suck. We all know this. But they're basically like the Protestants, okay? Anything but Catholics, basically. And again, Catholics wanted everyone to be Catholic. And so they, again, wanted everyone to know that they're the biggest, they're the baddest. Don't you forget it. Well... Remember how Jeanne was manipulative? hmm Well, she had wanted Urban to be their new confessor when the old one died of the plague. But he declined. And so her defensiveness reared its ugly head. Because her lifelong insecurities were punctured with his rejection. And so she was determined to make him pay for that. How could she do that, though? And that was to make friends with his enemies. And he wasn't in short supply of them, like I mentioned before. He had tons. And also, Jean had been obsessing over Urban for like five years. This is before the confessor had died. 
like hardcore obsessing over him. She wrote once, when I did not see him, I burned with love for him. And when he presented himself to me, I lacked the fate to combat the pure thoughts and the movements that I felt. I mean, well, that's something. (laughs) Also, like, years later, the contract with the demons of hell, that was re-examined by some handwriting analysts, and it was discovered that it was a match for Jean. Well, I'll be. Yes. So, again, she was a daughter of a baron. Her, like, uncle was right up there with King Louis and stuff, too. So, right up there with Cardinal Richelieu. You know, and so, it all, they all had ties to that nobility, which they were all Catholic. And, again, remember Richelieu. He hated Urban on a deep personal level because he had been publicly embarrassed by him a few years before when Urban had written this satirical piece about him. But he wasn't the cardinal then, so he didn't have any power. But he sat back and, you know, just waited. And then when he had this power, and then this convent in Loudun you know, like being possessed. And then they're saying my nemesis is the cause of it. Man, talk about playing the long game. Right? And then he swoops in. There's no going back after this. And basically he could just be like, kill him. And they're going to. So I... I mean, I guess so. (laughs) I mean, I just feel like everything... Went to, they weren't possessed. No, I don't think they were possessed, but that's a, that's a lot of people to get in on your con, you know? But it doesn't even have to be a con to them, though. Because, okay, if you're saying, because also you have to think about if these people are saying, look, We're going to have to go to war because they end up going to war. Like, there's a whole, like, Huguenot war shit that goes on. Like, I mean, shit gets real bloody. But if they're like, look, these people are going to overthrow us and they're not going to believe in Catholicism. So we have to prove to them that they need us. This is what we need to do. Yeah. You get, like, two young people to come underneath you to do the exorcisms, they really believe that, oh my God, like, okay, you tell like someone who's like shady and higher up, this is what needs to be done. They send two yahoos in that really believe these people are possessed. Mm -hmm. And these girls led by a head bitch who knows how to manipulate a situation, like they don't do what she's going to say. They have to do. Yeah. And also, I read somewhere that, like, they were getting, not they, but, like, Mignon and stuff, they were getting paid. But then when Richelieu, like, stopped getting paid for everything, that's when the exorcism stopped and everything was fine. Hmm. You know? So, we all know money makes you do some weird stuff. And we all know quarantine makes you do some weird stuff. For real. And they were quarantined for a long time. For a long time. But really, I mean, you were talking about the show Big Brother. I mean, just look at that show. Because even with that, I mean, it's a game of people thinking somebody's out to get them. And it's a game of, like, Mm -hmm. manipulation and all of that. And they kind of do that that stuff, too. So, I mean, it's like... It's like a real life version of Big Brother, essentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really, I mean, really, it is because they're locked up for quarantine for the plague, not because of a reality TV show. However, they still have the same manipulation, gossip, you know, all of that that's going on. And hell, it led to a fucking exorcism, it sounds like. Yeah, multiple. Allegedly. I feel like Urban was just in, not that he was a, good person per se but he wasn't who they made him out to be 
but he made enemies because he was arrogant. He wasn't an amazing person. Like, I think he seduced younger women by making them, like, confess their sins and shit to him. You know, like, that kind of thing. Like, he... Yeah, he took advantage of them and preyed on them, so uh yes. Yeah, so, like, I'm not... he's a predator. Yeah, I'm not saying he's a good guy, but I'm just saying, like, he made enemies and then thought, oh, I like, because I'm... I rub elbows with people, I'm untouchable, but then, like, he made the enemies with the wrong people... And just couldn't get out of it. And again, like, he was the scapegoat that they needed to make it legit. They just needed something to pin it on. Because, yeah, like, okay, we can feign everything else to make it seem real. But if we have one person to, like, blame it on, like, everyone's going to believe it. And they were like, got him. Yeah. Well, your story has a shit ton of manipulation in it, and so does mine. Ooh. My story idea for this week came from the Creepinati from Karen A. You know, our unofficial assistant that does an amazing job of keeping track of all of the freaking episodes that we cover and keeps a running Google Doc in the Facebook group so everyone can see. That Karen? Yeah, that Karen. She is freaking amazing. She even puts in, like, who's been shouted out. We really don't deserve her. No, we really don't. She's freaking amazing. Well, it's that, Karen. So, thank you so much for the story idea. But if I hate this story... We'll fire her for sure. Yeah. That's also a running joke. Obvi, we don't fire her because, you know, we don't pay her. (laughs) (laughs) So, last night we did Thirsty Thursday, and my phone was going out, and so they couldn't hear me. So I put on, so I was on webcam last night because I was looking cute. And uh, I was looking cute. Insert eye roll. You are cute, but Jesus Christ. Well, I was looking cute. So I was on webcam and they couldn't hear me. And so Creep Mom was like, "Uh, well, you need a whiteboard and, you know, you could do that. And I was like, oh my God, I have one. And so I, I had one. And so I just started writing down stuff. Well, then it turned into like a Wheel of Fortune kind of game, like fill in the blank. And so then I just started doing like who was there. And so for Karen, I did like Karen up top and then like blank, 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 you know, and they had to do it. Well, it was a lot. And everyone was like, huh. And they were like, I thought it would be you're fired. Yeah. (laughs) But it was best assistant anyone could have (laughs) but it was so funny because we always are like you're fired (laughs) and i mean shameless not so shameless plug but thirsty thursday is like a happy hour hangout on discord which if you're in patreon you get to be a part of as a benefit yes and it was started by iris like that was her idea and again we just all of the creepsters are freaking amazing and creative and everything. But it's her birthday, so shout out, birthday girl. So the story this week, there is an amazing article in Vanity Fair by Susanna Andrews. And I feel like that's kind of one of the tipping point articles that got a lot of information out there. There have been since then a couple of books written and, you know, of course, tons of articles since then. But I feel like the article in Vanity Fair was just like the article, you know, so you can't do this story without using the Vanity Fair article and giving it credit where credit's due. And I debated on this story, like I do with all of my stories, whether to start in chronological order or whether to start with kind of the main event that was the beginning of the end. But I think I'm going to do chronological order. And I literally just decided that. (laughs) When you said Susanna Andrews, that sounds so familiar. And I was just going to joke with you to be like, oh, I know her. But then I was like, wait, do I know her? Like, do I know of her? But no, it was V.C. Andrews is what I used to read. It was like, I swear, like murder mystery kind of weird or not even murder mystery. It was like she always did girl names in these books. It would be like Melody 
blah, da, da, da. Mm-hmm. Like, do you remember any mm-hmm. of that? Anyway, but I was like, is she writing for Vanity Fair now? Like, but anyway, does anyone remember V.C. Andrews? Tell mm-hmm. me I'm not the only one. My story starts out with Sandra Louise Singers. She was born in July 1934. Later in life, she knew she would go by the name Sandy, but eventually she changed her name to Sante. And so that's what we're going to call her throughout the story. So like even from right this moment on, I'm going to refer to her as Sante. Sante and her family lived right outside of Oklahoma City. She was the third of four children, and her parents eventually migrated to Southern California because of like the whole dust bowl and all of that, because they were sharecroppers. But eventually they had to migrate because they were incredibly poor and they weren't able to make ends meet. And when they migrated, her father left the family. Her mother did what she could while they were living in Los Angeles to make ends meet. According to Sante, her mother worked as a sex worker and the kids were in and out of foster homes and orphanages. But eventually, Sante was adopted by Edwin and Mary Chambers. After she was adopted, she basically went from living on the streets to a middle-class family. Sante started going to school, and when Sante was in high school, she lived the dream. She was a cheerleader She was in the Spanish club. She wrote for the newspaper, you know, did all the things, like was a class officer, you know, like did all the things in high school. She's very popular with the boys. She had a best friend and they called themselves kind of like Laverne and Shirley. Uh, That's why my mom called me and my friend Heather because she was tall and skinny and I was short and uh, not. Well, Laverne and Shirley were both skinny. Shamil, Shamlazel, Flaclevna Corporated. Nobody knows what they say. Oh, were they? Uh, see, I never knew. Yeah. Yeah. After Sante graduated high school in 1952, she was like, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to get a degree in journalism. But after about three months, she actually ended up marrying her high school sweetheart, Lee Powers. But after just three months, they got divorced. So then... She was like, okay, okay, I'm going to go to this six-week secretarial school. So she did that, and then she kind of bounced around California with her friend Ruth, which was her, you know, Laverne to her Shirley or vice versa. But eventually, she ended up going back to Carson City, where she married another guy from high school named Edward Walker. This was in 1956. When she married Edward, Edward, they had a son named Kent. But again, this marriage didn't last very long because this is when Sante started her affliction. Maybe that's not the right word, but her love, her joy of stealing. She was one of those people that even though she had something, she still wanted to steal it. Like, if she had the money to buy it, she would still steal it because she got the thrill out of stealing it. And so, in 1961, she had been arrested for petty theft, and Edward Walker was like, no, fuck that, I'm out. Like, I'm not dealing with you stealing shit. I would imagine that it wasn't like, oh, she was arrested this one time, and... I would imagine that he kind of knew what was going on and was like, you got to stop this. You got to stop this. You got to stop this. And then she got busted. I never saw anywhere that said if Edward kept custody of Kent, but just kind of based on the story, I really think that Kent stayed with Edward. After the divorce from Edward, it's said that she went back to Los Angeles where she continued to live a life of crime. She was a classic con artist. She could talk her way into and out of anything, basically. She would fabricate stories and steal and lie and cheat and literally just for the fun of it, but also to get what she wanted and once she got divorced to make ends meet. It's said that after the divorce, she did have to turn to sex work to make ends meet And that after that, she kind of resolved herself that like, look, I'm not 
going to live like this anymore. Like I am going to become rich and I am never living like this again. She was such a con artist that one time she was arrested for stealing a car. She had gone to a Cadillac dealership, test drove this convertible, and just never fucking brought it back. I don't have the audacity. That, 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 <laughs> like, sums up this whole, the audacity. <laughs> when they arrested her for it, she was like, they let me test drive it. Like, I'm still test driving it. It had been a month, girl. Um, People like that are the reasons why, like... They have to ride with us anyway. <laughs> you have to give your license. Yeah. I'm like, you have my license. Like, what if I get pulled over? <laughs> I know. It makes me so nervous when they ride with you. I'm like, oh, God. Ooh. I know. Well, eventually, she was looking at this magazine of just like millionaires. I don't know. And she saw this guy by the name of Kenneth Kimes. What's his last name? Kimes. K-I-M-E-S. So some stuff says that she actually married Kenneth Kimes and that he was her third husband. But it seems like most stuff said that he knew that she was a con artist because he was one himself. I was about to say, that name right there, that's why I was like, what's his last name? Kenneth Kimes? He sounds like a con artist. Right. And so he had her number. He knew she was a con artist. And he was like, he even told one of his friends, like, I'm not marrying her. If I marry her, she's going to take me for all my money. Mm -hmm. So they had a very symbiotic relationship where they each got what they wanted from each other. But he also was like, "Mm, nah, I'm not going to give her all my money. Because here's the thing. You know, I'm really, there's so much to this story that we literally could do a four hour episode just on Sante. So know that I'm skipping over a shit ton, but she's a pretty shitty human being and she treats people really badly. Like all of her ex-husbands where she's very domineering and treats them very, very poorly. And so majority of them did not stand up to her just for their basic rights. Not like, not in the, oh, they need to stand up and put her in place. No, 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 no. Just for their basic rights. Rights. They're just for some fucking human decency. Yeah. Already, I feel like she could be on a season of Dirty John. Oh, easily. I feel like we throw the word narcissist around a lot now. Like, I feel like that's just like the new word that everybody uses. Like, oh my God, they're such a narcissist, you know. But she truly is a narcissist in the truest sense of the word and manipulative and will do whatever she has to do to get what she wants. So Kenneth Kimes was a millionaire and he had worked his way up from basically a construction worker that had grown up from nothing. Had co- you know, his family had nothing and he was a construction worker that ended up making millions in the construction business in like commercial real estate type things. He owned tons of bu- like 30 buildings. When Kenneth and Sante got together, it was the perfect match because like I said, they both were schemers and scammers. The first scam that they ran together was back in I think it was 1972. We were coming up on America's bicentennial. It was like we were coming up on, you know, the 200 year anniversary of America. And what they did was they were selling all of this memorabilia type stuff like bumper stickers and, you know, just all this little flags and all this (laughs) stuff to be like, here's all this like bicentennial gear. But none of it was approved like bicentennial stuff. (laughs) <laughs> then what oh Sante did Sante faked the official bicentennial committee letterhead and like wrote this letter saying that Kenneth had been chosen to be the official spokesperson for like the national basically bicentennial and basically the bicentennial committee was like oh okay cool what <laughs> Like, Homedy was on the Rose Bowl. What? Like, giving this speech about patriotism. (laughs) 
She faked documents and got him in, got them into a party with the fucking first lady. Oh my gosh. Like, like now that would be, I mean, that's like a national security risk. Yeah. Like that's, like, do you remember not too long ago when that, that couple did that to meet the Obamas? Do you remember not too long ago? Like, obviously, at least four years ago. But you know, you remember that when they did that? No. That couple, they had been on like Real Housewives of something and they like snuck into a White House party. Uh uh-uh. uh. And people were like, how in the fuck did a, did somebody sneak in to a White House party? That means they got through the gate, they got through every bit of security at the White House to this party. And it's like, that is a threat to national security. They got within feet of the fucking president. Yeah. I mean, there's like actual pictures of them with the vice president and the first lady. That's a wild. Right. And apparently they kind of left a bad taste in people's mouths because they snuck into a bunch of parties in Washington, like boom, 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 boom. Some people say like that same night, but I don't know if it's all in one night, a couple of weeks, you know, it just kind of made people go, oh, that's distasteful, you know. But that was the first scheme that they did together. Now, Sante knew because Kenneth wasn't going to marry her, she had to sink her teeth into him somehow. She got pregnant. Of fucking course. Oh, my gosh. So, in 1975, Kenneth Kimes Jr., he goes by Kenny, was born. Here's the thing, though. She didn't tell anybody she was pregnant until, like, a couple weeks after she had the kid. Like, literally, had the kid, the kid was in the house for a couple of weeks before... Kenneth Sr. even knew she had the kid. Um, yeah. I don't um, know if I can know. I don't know. She's a, she is the ultimate con artist. No words. <laughs> well, so allegedly, Kenneth Combs had a really bad drinking problem. So they say that maybe that's how she got away with hiding some of this stuff was because he was literally drunk most of the time. But Sante was all over Kenny. He basically had no chance of a normal life. He was so fucking spoiled. He couldn't go to school. He had tutors. If he had friends, they had to like go play with him at the park and all of that. And a lot of times the parents wouldn't want their kids to play with him because Sante would be like, basically like, well, is your kid good enough to play with my kid? Because he's basically a genius. Oh, my God. Right. And he's he's not, you know, because, again, she's a con artist and she makes lies up and all the things. The other thing, too, is that she would not allow tutors and all of that to teach morals to him. I heard on a podcast, I never saw this on any of the articles that I read, but on this podcast I was listening to, they said that one time a tutor caught Kenny lying and she told him the story about the boy who cried wolf. And... Sante found out about it and grabbed the tutor, took her in the bedroom and threw her on the bed and was like, you don't teach my son right from wrong. I teach him that. Well, um, well what you just did was wrong. But she doesn't care. Right. To her, literally everyone's an asset and she owns them. Yeah. Everyone works for her. They don't work with her. They work for her. And you know, that's my pet peeve when someone says, so-and-so yes. works for me. Yes. No, they don't. You don't fucking own them. Except she thought she did. That brings me to my next thing. Oh. The other scam that she and Kenneth Sr. would do, so they had like a, a nice vehicle, like a Cadillac or Lincoln or some shit like that. And so they would take their nice car and, uh, you know, they're white and they would go across the border to Mexico. They would go to these poorer areas and they would pick up young girls and they would tell the girls and their families hey, you know, we need help at our hotels that we own. We need help at our house for housekeepers, that sort of thing. We'll pay you a good wage. Like, you know, we'll take care of you. We'll help you get your citizenship, blah, 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 blah. And then they would be like, oh, my God, yes. Like, I'll be able to send money back to my family. You know, I'll get into the States. abso fucking lootly. So the girls would hide in the trunk to get across the border. And it's you know, 70s, 80s, and it's this, what appears to be this rich white couple, nobody's going to ask to check their trunk. 
going across the border. So they would be able to smuggle these girls across the border. Once they got them across the border, those girls did not get the American dream. Those girls were living in hell. They would be forced to work 16, 18 hours a day, you know, cleaning. They would be abused by Sante, like burned with curling irons, forced to take scalding hot showers. They would be locked in their rooms, never allowed to leave, never allowed to talk to their families. Oh, my gosh. Eventually, it was it was found out. And Sante and Kenneth were arrested for slavery. Wow. At first... People were like, oh, you know, da, da, da. But when they saw that the deadbolts on the girls' doors were on the outside, not the inside, they were like, oh, wait. Like, these girls are telling the truth. Because yeah. I, one of them escaped is what happened. I think is how it got, it came to light. Well, Kenneth cut a deal. So he just had to, like, pay a fine and go to alcohol rehab. Or, like, go to, like, AA. Like, I don't even think it was rehab. I think it legit was just, like, pay a fine and go to AA. Which is... I'm not dissing AA. I'm just saying in the grand scheme of yeah. you fucking kidnapped women and tortured them. Right. Or or lured them under false pretenses and tortured them. Mm-hmm. And then didn't let them go. So, but Sante, being Sante, thought that she could take this to trial, woo the jury, and be like, well, I didn't know, blah, 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 blah. Well, it didn't fucking work. And she got sentenced to five years in prison. When she was in prison, Kenny got to live a normal life. He got to go to school. He got to make friends. And he was living his best life. He thrived because Sante was in prison and she wasn't holding him under her thumb anymore. Right. She was a helicopter mom in before. The, right. And, and But even more than a helicopter mom, she was like abusive and manipulative mm-hmm. and would make him do things that he didn't want to do and, you know, yeah. all of that. She ended up getting out of prison early. I can't remember if it was two or three years. And he was so upset when she got out of prison early because it meant that his life was going back to the way it was. Well, in 1978, I know this is kind of like, I'm kind of jumping around the timeline a little bit, but this was this was kind of one of Sante's biggest things. She was really into insurance fraud. So, She would make claims for insurance things that never existed or, oops, something would just catch on fire. So she made a claim on one of their houses in Honolulu because, again, Kenneth Kimes was loaded, had houses in Honolulu, all over the states, like, which obviously I know Honolulu's in states, but you get my point, like just fucking everywhere. So they had a house in Honolulu and one of Kenneth Kimes' sisters lived in the house. And she tried to make a claim on this tapestry saying that this $100,000 tapestry had been stolen out of the house. And the insurance company was like, hmm, $100,000 tapestry? We need to investigate this shit. And so they're like, "Let let me see. Like, let's do some investigating. So they actually interview her sister-in-law to be like, was this tapestry? Tell me about this tapestry. And her sister-in-law's like, what? There was no tapestry like that here. And so they're like, we're not paying you. That made Sante so pissed that she went there and she locked the sister-in-law in the house and basically like, Kept her in there, like kidnapped her in that house, would not let her out. And from what I understand, too, was like kind of abusing her in there. And Kenneth knew about it and did nothing. Wow. That's the power because she had just, she would just beat her husband. I mean, I know we weren't married to her, but she would just like beat them down with her, just her, you know? Mm -hmm. Like literally, she starved that sister in law in that house. And eventually, another family member was like, wait, what is going on? Where is she? And like, came and like, broke her out of the house. Wow. She tried to file a claim on a Rolex worth $30,000, saying that she had bought it for her husband. It was stolen. Never existed. The house in Honolulu 
mysteriously caught on fire, air quotes around that, and she tried to get the insurance money from that. One time in 1985, they were in Washington, D.C., and Sante and Kenneth were staying at this hotel, and they left Kenny sleeping in the hotel room, and they went down to the hotel bar, and she stole this woman's meat coat. Now, I thought you said meat coat. I okay, was like, Lady Gaga. Yeah, I was like, wait, Lady Gaga wasn't original on that? No. But, okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, keep in mind, Sante has, at this point, multiple mink coats of her own. So she's literally just stealing this for the pure enjoyment of it. And meanwhile, that's the problem. This is what pisses me off. That could have been that woman's only mink coat that she stole. You know, that may have been... It could have been a family family heirloom. Exactly. And she's fucking stealing it. So she ended up getting arrested for it. She had tried to avoid trial, avoid trial, avoid trial. But eventually, she was finally taken to trial for it. And she was convicted of stealing the, the mink coat. But apparently, while the jury was deliberating, she left town. What? And at this time... In Washington, D.C., if you weren't present for the reading of the verdict and you were found guilty, it's grounds for like a mistrial, like a reversal. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So. No, you're not. You're kidding me? No, I'm not. not No, 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 no. no, no, I'm not kidding you. So it like over. It's over because she was gone. So all you have to do is run. Skip town and you're good. That is the dumbest rule ever (laughs) yeah but it was what's funny though is it was like a month later that she was arrested on the slavery thing so jokes on you oh my god oh my god oh my god yep so after sante and kenneth had dealt with the whole slavery thing the women who had been enslaved filed a 35 million dollar civil suit against them go them go those women they should get every fucking penny of that So they hired an attorney by the name of Doug Crawford to help them fight against the $35 million civil suit. She was very overbearing. She would say things like, write him a letter to the world's greatest attorney and lovable staff from the president of your fan club. But then she would also say, just to be clear, if you lose this, I'm going to sue you for malpractice. Like, what? Yes. I mean, she's just very like, like Katy Perry, you're hot and you're cold. Like, there's... (laughs) But so manipulative. Like, you know, it's like she's going to get what she fucking wants. So they ended up settling that case. And I don't know how much the women that they fucking enslaved got. But here's the thing. She wasn't happy with the settlement. And in October of 1990, Doug Crawford's office was firebombed. Really? Yeah. And they, of course, could never find evidence that linked it to Sante. But, I mean, he's like, no, she fucking did it. Like, she fucking did it. Because, so this is what Sante would say. She said that the women's attorney had made up the allegations on them because they worked for, they being the other, the women's attorney, worked for the Hawaiian Mafia. And when the office got firebombed, she said, honey, I just knew they would get you. Um, Ma'am, you knew they would get you because you knew that they were you. 100. In that Vanity Fair article, there's a quote I wanted to read real quick from Crawford, that attorney. He said, she would torture the maids to make them subservient to her petty needs. She would torch my office to fit her legal case. She has no empathy. I remember I went to Geronimo Way in 1990 to investigate the facts of the case. Upstairs is a long hallway with bedrooms off the corridor. This is where the maids were. And I went in each room, and three or four rooms had deadbolts on the doors on the outside. These were prison cells. I was looking at one, and I got chills. I turned around, and there was Sante. She had sneaked in behind me, and I got the look. I thought, she's going to kill me. So... About four months after Doug Crawford's office was firebombed, there was this guy named Elmer Holmgren. Now, this is a guy who was an insurance adjuster that 
had one night gotten a little too drunk and let it slip that he worked for Sante and that he was paid to, you know, set some fires for her. Oh, uh, what? Uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. Once he let it slip that he was paid to set some fires for her, the ATF came knocking. The Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency here in the States. So the ATF comes and they're like, hey, you did what? Did you do a firebomb? Did you do all this stuff? Tell me what you've been doing. Well, Osante gets wind of it. And after that, after he becomes an informant for the ATF, he leaves and goes to Costa Rica with Sante and Kenneth Kimes. And that is the last time anyone ever saw him. Wow. I'm sorry. How did she get wind of it? I don't know. Also, how did he not, like, have a wire on or something? You know? Well, and she's so manipulative and she's so... Yeah, that's true. I mean, like, she can talk her way out of a wet paper bag. I mean, she can manipulate anybody to do fucking anything. So, and if you're that terrified of her and she's like, let's go to Costa Rica, you're like, okay. Okay, yeah. You don't want to say no and, like... Duh. Well, yeah, you don't want to say no because then you're going to be, like... Firebombed? (laughs) Yes. I mean, really? Yeah. Well, then... Okay, so after... I think it was the Honolulu house. Yeah, it was the Honolulu house. It had burned down. And the insurance company was like, like, we're not fucking paying for this. Like, this was set on fire. We are not fucking paying for this. Well, so this was, the insurance company was the Chubb Corporation. And apparently this is like a huge, I know, Donna, insert penis joke. <laughs> y'all could have fucking seen her shit-eating grin. <laughs> okay, sorry. So they refused to pay. So, Sante starts stalking the CEO, threatens his fucking children. What? Yes. So, that insurance company ends up filing a lawsuit against them because they're like, she's stalking the CEO and threatening his children. So, they end up filing a lawsuit against her. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. So, in 1994, Kenneth Combs died from an aortic aneurysm. Well, remember, they had never gotten married, and his will was written in 1963, so it only had his his first wife and his kids that did not include Kenny Combs. Oh, shit. So, Sante and Kenny got nothing. So, Sante was like, I'm not fucking having any of this. So, she told No one that he died. What? She didn't tell his family for like two years that he had died. So she basically was like draining his accounts for years with no one knowing, like trying to get his estates and stuff in her name, forging documents, getting shit notarized, like forging his signature, trying to get all these properties in her name without... People know it. So, like, on his death certificate, she got another Kenneth Kimes social security number put on it. Wow. Right. Isn't that tiring? Right? Like, golly. Okay, so a lot of Kenneth Kimes' money was in offshore accounts. So there was this guy named Syed Ahmed. He was a problem account investigator for Gulf Union Bank in the Cayman Islands. And that was a bank that the Combs had an account. So basically, it was like, huh, there's some weird shit going on with this account. I'm a problems account investigator. Let me look into it. So he's digging into this account. Well, not long after he's looking into this account, he disappears. And his hotel Completely fucking cleared out. Imagine that. Exactly. One of the next schemes to talk about is, okay, do you remember before when we talked about how Sante and Kenneth Combs Sr. had been arrested for the slavery charges and they had been involved in the civil suit? Yes. Okay. 
So they had a friend named David Kasdan. So I've heard a couple of things of how David fits into this story. I've heard that David was a business associate of Kenneth. I've heard that he was just a family friend of them. I also heard that maybe Sante and David had an affair. But ultimately, the whole point is that when Kenneth and Sante were going through the slavery charges and the ultimate civil suit, they were trying to hide some property so that it didn't get taken in the civil suit because they didn't want all of their assets to be available, you know, when you're going through like the financial stuff to be like, okay, well, this is what they have available to be like, okay, well, I want 35 million. And they're like, well, I'm only worth five. And it's like, well, you've got this property and this property and this property, sell it and give it to me. Right. So they wanted to put a property of theirs in David Kazan's name so that they could hide it from the civil suit. And David agreed with the understanding that once the civil suit was over, the property would be transferred back into Kenneth Combs' name. And as far as David knew, that's exactly what happened. Well, that's not what happened. One day, years and years later, like in the late 90s, David Kasdan gets, you know how whenever you... um buy a house or a car and you get the little booklet of all of your payment brochures. Yes. And you never use them, but you can right. send that in with your check. Yeah. And now you just use automatic draft, but back then you would actually send that in with your yeah. check. Okay. Well, it's so daunting. Because you like, see, you're like, oh, I have 875 of these. Yeah, like, oh God. <laughs> well, David gets this on this property and he's like, okay, well, first off, didn't know I still had this property in my name. Second of all, I did not take out a mortgage on this property in my fucking name. What is this? And so he like calls the fraud department and is like, I did not fucking do this. And they're like, um, well, we have notarized signatures of you saying that you did. And he's like, well, I fucking didn't. So you need to fucking do some investigating. Well, Sante gets wind of it. How, How I don't know. She always does. And she tries to convince David to go along with it because, duh, it's her. I don't even know how that would help her because if it's a mortgage, wouldn't that just go to another bank? Well, but she's not on the property. So she takes the money out fraudulently under his name. She gets the cash. But how? Where's the cash? It goes, somehow it goes to her because it's not going, I don't know. I see what you're saying. Yeah, because it would go to a bank if it's another mortgage. I guess it goes probably to one of her offshore accounts. But that's stupid because like you wouldn't, the bank wouldn't say, oh, you want another mortgage on it. Okay, we're going to send you the money for what it's worth. You know what I mean? Right. However, she had a ton. Well, I don't know about a ton. She had a lot of shell companies. So yeah. she was very, very smart when it came to this. Like, as this all kind of unravels, it took police a long time to tease out, again, all of her shell companies and all of the, like, following the money. Yeah. Because she was very smart when it came to that. Yeah. I just don't have the criminal mind to... Do all of this because right there I would have been like, huh, I could take out a second mortgage and get the cash. Oh, no, it would go straight to another bank, not anything else that's null and void then onto another scheme. Not her. Like she figured out a way, you know, and got the money. Yeah. I just don't I don't know how to do that. Well, because David Kasdan would not go along with the plan, she did what we've known her to do thus far, she had to get rid of whoever stands in her way. Right. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what we later find out ends up happening. But what ends up happening is Kenny comes, shoots David Kasdan in the back of the head. Oh my gosh. And they dispose of his body in a trash can. Wow. 
she is the lowest of low when she has turned her son into that. Yeah. So what they did was they took David Kazan's body in his own Jaguar to LAX and then put it in, like I said, a dumpster near one of the car rental places and just left the Jaguar close to it. Now that David Kazan's out of the way, now she's like, okay, now let's sell the house. Well, there's no David Kasdan, so she got to have somebody to play David Kasdan. Well, she already had just the person. Because just like she had done in the past to get the young women in Mexico, she was doing that now in the States because she had recruited a man who was homeless. And that is who Kenny forced to help him move and get rid of David Kasdan's body. So they picked up this homeless man and they were like, hey, you know what? We've got some work for you. We're going to treat you amazing. You know, blah, blah, blah. Same ruse that they used to get the women in Mexico. And they told him like, hey, we just need you to pretend to be this guy so that we can sell this house. And he was like, okay. Well, little did he know he was also going to have to dispose of a body. And little did he know that they were going to basically hold him prisoner and beat him. And when they had trouble selling the house, of course, what did they do? They do what they always do and set fire to it. So just a couple of weeks after the murder of David Kasdan, Sante and Kenny left L.A., They started making their way to New York because the cops in L.A. were kind of on to them. They stopped over in Utah to buy a car. Now, this car dealership was one that Kenneth Combs had used multiple times. So it was one that was like they had bought cars from. So it wasn't like, oh, there's just a random car dealership where they were like, sure, write a check. We'll take it, you know. Absolutely. Like it was one that they had done a lot of business with. And so they were comfortable being like, absolutely, Sante, like, here's the car, write a check. We'll catch you on the flip side kind of thing. She picks up this Lincoln Town car, writes them basically like a $15,000 check and drives off the lot. Well, the check bounces. Some people say that the check, she really didn't mean for the check to bounce. Like she really thought the money was there, but just because of like financial stuff it it didn't and she re- like she really didn't mean for it to bounce but either way it bounced and she tried to get out of it and to be like oh my gosh I'm going to pay it blah 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 and they knew her so they were like tried to give her the benefit of the doubt and be like okay okay you know let you know absolutely like shit happens like just get us the money you know the next day well she never did and she never did and she never did So they went to the police and the police put out a, basically a warrant for her for writing a bad check. Now, Utah is not going to go hunt down someone for writing a bad check, right? But the LAPD is like, well, we're pretty sure they murdered David Kasdan, but we can't prove it. But you got a warrant out for their arrest for this bad check. If we find them, We'll bring them back to you and you arrest them for this because we can't arrest them for this murder yet. But we're like 99% sure they did it. We just can't arrest them yet. So while all this is going down, Sante and Kenny Combs are making their way back over to New York. They want to get more money, more property, all the things, right? It's what they always want. More, 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 more. Once they made it to New York, Kenny and Sante started a new con. Kenny moved in to a new apartment under the name of Manny Guerin. And Sante acted as his assistant and would visit him every so often and went by the name of Eva Guerrero. So what made this apartment so special is it was owned by Irene Silverman. So Irene was a kind of rags to riches ballerina. She was born in New Orleans in 1916 from an immigrant family and became this amazing ballerina. She married wealthy and 
She and her husband owned a beautiful townhouse on the Upper East Side, like a block away from Central Park. So this multi-million dollar home. Well, after her husband died, Irene Silverman became a little bit of a recluse in that she never left her house. She was still very into parties and she would have parties at her house. She still was very engaged in her neighborhood and had a lot of friends, but everybody kind of came to her. She didn't leave the house and she had a lot of people that worked at the house. So a lot of staff, as far as, you know, people who cleaned the house, she had, you know, people who helped her keep up the lawn and, you know, just all, all of that. And so, I don't know if you have a lawn in New York, but you get the point. Like the, all the maintenance things. But it was this huge house with all of these rooms. And so she ended up, just to kind of keep her company, turning a bunch of these rooms into apartments. And these apartments leased for $6,000 a month. $6,000 a month? Yes. Oh, oh, oh my God. Yeah, each. And I think she had like five of them. Holy sh- Holy. Yeah. Right. So can you imagine how much money she was raking in? And, no. And can you imagine how big that house had to be? No. Right. But she was also very particular. You know, when she opened her home to making these new apartments, she, of course, put up security cameras, and she always made the tenants provide references and all of that because, again, you're inviting strangers into your home. And at this point, she's in her 80s. So she's still, like, very healthy, very active. Even though she's a bit of a recluse, she's still very active. It's not like she's, like, bedridden. She just is protective. Well, Irene gets a new tenant by the name of Manny. And Manny comes in and offers her $6,000 cash, but doesn't provide references. And because he's given her cash, she's like, okay, that's fine, but get me the references tomorrow. Well, tomorrow rolls around and Manny doesn't have the references. And the next day rolls around, Manny doesn't have the references. And she's starting to get kind of a weird vibe from Manny. And she even tells her friends because she's like sitting one day having coffee or something with her friends. And he comes in because remember, she has the security cameras and she's like, look at him. Like, do you see how he's like avoiding the security cameras? Like he's weird, right? She's like, he's just bizarre. I don't like him. Like I want him out. The people who work in the house say that he won't let them into the apartment to clean his apartment, whereas all the other tenants, that's part of it. They go in, they clean their apartments, as well as the rest of Irene's house. And Irene would say that she could see his feet standing at the door. Like, he was, like, looking out the peephole, but, like, wouldn't say anything. But, like, clearly you can see the shadow of his feet standing there. Like, he's watching outside of his peephole, but, like, not saying anything. That sounds like a scary movie. Right. And then the only person that would ever come and go from his apartment was this older lady, Eva, who's his assistant. Mm-hmm. And so she just got a weird vibe from him. She told him to move out. He was like, I'm not moving out. And so she had started the process with her attorney to get him evicted. She just was like, this is just weird. I don't like it. This is just weird. Well... July 4th rolls around, and Irene has this huge party at her house, like she always did, and it was an amazing night. Everything went off without a hitch. She and her building manager even decided that on Monday, July 6th, that they were going to be serving him with the eviction notice. Well, July 5th rolls around, and about 11 o'clock that morning, Because, so, you know, it it was a holiday weekend, so after the party, the next day, she basically gave everybody off except for one one employee that was working that day to kind of clean everything up and help her out around the house, and she had given her a a list of things that needed to be done, you know, take the dog out, all the things, and she remembered seeing Irene standing there, like, in her dressing gown outside of the office door, which was right beside Manny's apartment, Gave her the list of things to do. And so she gets back from running all of her errands. And when she gets there, Irene's gone. And again, Irene never left the house. She didn't go to the grocery store. She didn't leave to go literally anywhere. She had people who did those things for her. People came to her. People came to her parties. People came to her. She didn't go to people. And 
as soon as she noticed that she was gone, she called the building manager and was like, something's going on. Irene isn't here. What the what is happening? So he called police. It's a holiday weekend. You know, there's not that many detectives on call. And, you know, it's a missing person. And for that matter, it's an elderly missing person. So it's kind of like, give it to the rookie kind of thing, right? So all these senior detectives are like, Dude, you take it. Give it to the rookie. Little did they know that this was going to be one of the biggest cases of the fucking decade that they just gave to the rookie detective. And like career making cases. And serves them fucking right. Exactly. So he gets to the house and they tell them exactly that. She never leaves. She's nowhere here. And the house is so big that He calls in uniformed officers to come search because there's literally so many rooms in the house that it's like, well, I mean, it's like fucking whack-a-mole. They could be looking over here and she could have popped over there. And like, let's bring uniformed officers in and like, like a grid search. Let's look at, like, let's make this like a uniformed, pun not intended because it's uniformed officers, but you get the point, like a, an organized search. And while they're doing all this, the building manager is telling the detective about the new weird tenant that she wanted out. And his name is Manny. And so the detective's like, well, where does he live? Let's go, let's go talk to him. And he's like, well, he's right there. So they go, Manny's not answering. Manny's not answering. So they open the door because, hello, it's Irene's house. They can do what they want to. And gone. So it's like, okay, the weird tenant is gone. And so is Irene. Uh, what the what? And so they've run his name. And of course... Manny who? There's no Manny. That person does not exist. So they get a sketch artist and they sketch out who Manny looks like. And they blast it all over the news. Irene Silverman missing. Like this person wanted a connection. Have you seen either one of them? While this is happening, Sante and Kenny get pulled over in the Lincoln town car because it's stolen. And when they get pulled over, of course, because it's stolen, they get arrested. And when they get arrested, Sante has a bag full of Irene's belongings. It's got papers to transfer the deed of the house and like all this documentation, like with her signature notarized, like all this stuff. It's got her diary, not Irene's. Sante's diary like like talking about how she was going to do all this and like basically her whole plan it's got Irene's IDs it's got it's got a box for a stun gun it's got a gun she's got a gun she's got all this stuff when they arrest Kenny comes to by the by just to tell you who he is he pees his pants oh gosh well at first they didn't the police didn't realize what they had Because it's different, like, it's like LAPD arresting them for the car to take them back to Utah for all that. You know, like, Mm -hmm. it's not NYPD. And that night, that arresting officer is watching the news and sees that Irene Silverman missing, sees a sketch artist thing, and he's like, wait, what? And he remembers the name on all that shit that Sante had. And he's like, boop, boop, boop. so I just arrested this lady and this is all the shit she had. And I think you should look into it. And the case fucking explodes. Wow. So long story short, they end up putting all the fucking pieces together and they end up going to trial for Irene Silverman's murder. Now, this is, I think, the first case in New York without a body. Because we still, to this day, do not know where Irene is. What? Yes. And, okay, here's the creepy part. I mean, not that all of it's not creepy. But, so basically, they kind of had to do a gag order on Sante. Because, so she would not testify in the trial. Because they, they tried them together. And Sante would not testify in the trial because if she did, it left her open to her previous 
conviction being brought up of the slavery charge. And so if she got on the stand, then they could bring that up. But if she didn't get up in the stand, they couldn't bring it up, right? So she wouldn't get on the stand. So what she did was she tried to trial by media. So she tried to do all like like 60 minutes interview. She tried to do all these media interviews. So the judge basically had to be like, you have to stop doing media interviews. You got to stop. Well, it kind of backfired a little bit because people were so creeped out by them. People really believed that they had an incestuous relationship because they were constantly like holding hands. And there was even reports like of when Kenny was in college and she would come visit, like how they would share a bed just weird things like that that typical sons in their teenage and early 20 years don't do with their mothers. And then even at the trial, because they were like just being so bizarre and like holding hands and like kissing and like not, it, it wasn't like mother-son kissing. It wasn't like tongue, but it was just uncomfortable kissing. They had to separate them by an attorney. Mm-mm-mm. Like they literally had to put an attorney sitting in between them. Mm -mm. And then when the attorney would get up, they would immediately start like canoodling, like like, holding hands, like leaning in, like talking to one another, like every time the attorney got up. No. Yes. It's so weird. So weird. They both ended up being convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Then they were both going to get extradited back to L.A. for the murder of David Kasdan. But in California the death penalty was on the table. So Kenny Combs, being the brilliant mind that he is, decided in order to save his mom from the death penalty, he was going to do an interview. And in this interview, in order to prevent his mom from getting the death penalty, he was going to hold the reporter hostage with a pin at her neck. Um, that's not how this works. Right. And so for four hours, there was a hostage negotiation. That is really hard. That took 17 takes. (laughs) One of those negotiations. And eventually he gave in. And of course it didn't work. But what he ended up doing, though, was he pled guilty and said, okay, 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 we're guilty. And I'll testify against my mother if you promise no death penalty for us. And they were like, cool. So he pled guilty testified against his mom and of course they were like when they were both on you know during the trial blah 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 blah. so he ended up saying that they did they killed irene silverman which is why we have some like details about that like taser blah 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 david kasdan and ahmed and the caymans and elmer holmgren who mysteriously disappeared in costa rica So, I mean, that's four people that we, well, three that we know, one that's like, well, you know. Highly likely. Exactly. Well, Sante Combs died in May of 2014 at the age of 79 in prison, and Kenny Combs is still in prison to this day. Wow. There's been tons of made-for-TV movies and books Her other son has written a book about his mother. And, you know, I feel like he's lucky that he got away, basically. That's why I think his dad raised him, not her. Because, again, I feel like she would have preyed on him the way she preyed on Kenny had, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But that's the story of Sante and Kenny Combs. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And and I'm telling you, I like scratch the surface. There's so many scams. Like I tried to give you Cliff's notes of all of them. Yeah. It's a saga for sure. Yes. Well, last week you grossed us out by a dad and a daughter this time. Maybe a mom and a son. I don't know. Yeah, I got to get out of the family shit. Yeah, please, please. No more family people. Yeah, please, please. That's true. I didn't even realize that it was... That mm-hmm. two weeks in a row. Ugh. You got anything to tell us, Scary? Hell. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Ugh. Well, we always want to hear y'all's opinions. Absolutely. And thank y'all so much for the story suggestions because they never fucking disappoint. 
Ugh, no, they don't. Wow. I cannot believe I've never heard anything about them. Me neither. How? Where Have I been living under a rock? I bet there's a Vanity Fair episode about them. True. Like, I watched that show. How have I fucking missed that? Yeah, true, true, true. Wow. Well, Wait, they, that's people. Oh, oh yeah. Well, never mind. <laughs> well, there should be a Vanity Fair. Right. That was a very well-written article. Very thorough. But there's there's so many of them. I know there's a um a Snapped episode on it because I did listen to the Snapped podcast, which is just the show in podcast form, like how Dateline does now. But y'all, thank y'all so much for the suggestions. Thank y'all so much for all of the support. Don't forget to like, review, subscribe, all the things. And remember, creep it real and and don't don't get scared. scared.